Alejandro, welcome to the podcast. So pumped to be here, Gary. Yeah. So we've been hanging out for a couple of years, working together on projects, and I thought it was about time I brought you on to the podcast. But we're going to talk all things digital marketing. So how did you get your start in digital marketing? Like, where did that begin for you? Yeah. So I read a book, I think it's called either The Road or Path to Success by Bill Gates. And it said by the year 2010, half of every single dollar is going to be spent online. And it's still etched into my school. And uh, figure, I wanted to figure out how to make money. And the funny thing, the reality is actually in 1998, 99, I didn't have a car. Uh, and I was 18, 19 year old, young punk. And um, what ended up happening was I wanted to figure out how to make money online because I didn't have a car. I didn't want to walk to McDonald's and work. And so I figured out how to make money on the internet. I uh, did some ministry. And so in order to kind of supplement that income, I was too prideful to send sponsorship letters. And so what we ended up doing was making like $800 here, $300 here, $1,500 here. And back then, it was all about search engine optimization, basically oh, yeah. how to rank your website high in Google. And so I'd rank these website, buy domains, rank these website, and sell little tiny affiliate products. And um, you know, it's kind of how I got my start. And I, I didn't make a ton of money right away. And then in 2006, learned some things. And uh, you know, 25 year old young punk made my first six figures, and the rest was kind of history. And I started an agency after that. It was my first agency. And then in 2012, I sold that in order for my wife to go to nursing school. So we moved from California to Seattle. And as you know, I, I got recruited by PushPay. And that, that was just a crazy story. I think I was like employee 25 through 30. Within 45 days of me working there, um, we started generating so many leads that we went from like 25, 30 to like 90 in like three weeks. It was absolutely- 90 employees. 90 employees. It was absolutely <laughs> insane. And I was there for a couple of years, built the digital strategy for them. Um, you know, we were, had 600 employ, uh, uh, customers at the time. And then by the time I left to move to Eastern Washington, we had over 7,000 customers. And so um, that was one of the most greatest experiences of my life, you know, really growing not only as a leader, uh, excuse me, as a marketer, but, but as a leader as well, really understanding how to scale organizations and, you know, just fascinating experience. How old were you? In 98, 99, when you're like, okay, I'm going to make some money on the internet. I was seven, Carrie. I was, no, I was, <laughs> you were seven uh, years no I, was, I just graduated. I just graduated. Yeah. I was 18 years old. So you're in right out of high school. I, I, I right out of high school. And, you know, I was like, ah, I went to college for two weeks and I dropped out. Uh, <laughs> and the, 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 but the real stories, that's a fun story for the entrepreneur world. But the, the church world, the, yeah. the, real, the reality is I actually went to Bible school. So I dropped out of school after two weeks, went to Bible school. I uh, got in, did, did an internship master's commission type program. And that's kind of where I started really, you know, understanding marketing and psychology and human behavior and just really studying what makes people tick and buy. Hmm. So what, what, like, what, was it a means to an end? You just wanted to not walk and you needed a car and you're like, you read that Bill Gates thing and you say to yourself, I think I can figure this out. That was like the only thing, like, you know, I was a young kid and I wanted a nice little car. And so I just, I just had to make money. And what it became was, you're right. It, it was a means to an end because here's what I believe. I believe everyone has like some sort of calling, some sort of message inside of them. And I felt that same way at 11 years old that I wanted to share something with the world. And I thought what better way than instead of going one to one, going one to many. And the internet is such a great place uh, for anyone to take an idea, a message, a calling and, and get it out there to the world because, you know, the world needs, you know, what we have inside. What did your first digital agency do before you joined PushPay? Yeah, we did. Uh, early on, we did um, uh, search engine optimization. We would do social media. This is when Twitter and Facebook was, 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 was big. Uh, this is before Instagram, which is crazy. This is for, before TikTok and Snapchat. And, you know, um, so we talked a lot about, you know, we really teach people how to use social media properties and Web 2.0 properties and how to rank them. And so we worked with local small business owners, restaurants, chiropractors, local churches, and it's like when someone searches you, they're going to they're gonna search you before they actually show up to your place of business. And so we want to we wanna own that front page. So not only did we own the first listing, we wanted to use several different pages and own the entire page. So when someone types in Sacramento chiropractor or Seattle dentist, 
we wanted to own that top page. And so it gave people a reason to not look anywhere else. Were you pretty much self-taught or how did, how did no, you figure that out? Absolutely not, not self-taught. I, 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 um, I learned from mentors. I basically played dumb. I played a possum and just started connecting with people and wanting to learn uh, how to get better. And so I really believe the shortcut, and this is why people that are listening right now, the, the shortcut to, to quick growth and fast growth is really studying what other people do. And so that's what's so amazing about your podcast is really teaching people how to become better leaders, high impact leaders. And, and so for me, I really just, you know, YouTube, Google, just really studying how to do this. And, uh, you know, I was too naive not to not try it. I just did it. And, you know, some of the stuff finally worked. <laughs> that's incredible. Um, you know, it's, it's so funny. You, you mentioned that's what this podcast is for. I was listening to another podcast recently and it featured a Princeton professor who was talking about the case method. And of course, I studied at law school. That's it's the case method, right? You just read cases, try to figure out where the law landed on stuff, and then you go write an exam and argue. And that's kind of what this podcast is. It's just a whole bunch of case studies, right? Case studies in leadership. And, uh, and it, it makes it, but I'm like, oh yeah, I hadn't really thought about that, but I developed the platform where people learn through the case method. Here's what's fascinating. Like, not only are you, you know, the guy, I mean, this is your Carrie Newhoff leadership podcast, but like you get to interview people and learn from, so, so you are, and there's a big difference between a know-it-all and a learn-it-all. A know-it-all says, you know, like I, I, you know, I'm just going to just do my thing and, you know, not, you know, look for advice, not go to YouTube, not listen to podcasts. And they kind of just, they know it all. They're in the room and they know it all. You know, they're always, you know, cynical about people's ideas, but the learn it all says, you know what? I want to go out there and I want to study the greats. I want to study because everyone has value. Everyone has something to say. And that's what I love about you. You've probably gotten a lot smarter as a result of listening to some of the smartest minds that have been on your podcast. Oh, so much. One of my, one of my long-term goals, probably not for a year or two, but I'm going to sit down, take two or three months off, get transcripts for all three or 400 episodes, mm -hmm. whatever we're at. And I'm going to write a book just on with different chapters on different things. Look for all the parallels, look for all the, the things that work. This is like way down the road. I'm pretty excited to do that. But I, I do find I'm learning and I'm open. And that's why, you know, when we had the opportunity to work together a couple of years ago, I jumped at it because I thought, okay, you know, 10,000 times more about marketing than I do. And a little knowledge is dangerous. So brought a pro in. I want you to take me back to those early days at PushPay. And PushPay, just explain what they do. They're one of the largest online digital giving platforms in the world, are they not? They would have Yeah, to biggest biggest mobile giving platform. I think, I don't know, last time I checked, over $2 billion had been uh, given to the kingdom as a result, probably more than $3 billion, I would say now. And so, um, so yeah, so they, they, you know, you go to Church Sunday and they, they uh, it's just the easiest, fastest way to, to digitally give. So for churches and do they do not for profits or is it exclusively you know, I, churches? I, I would say they, they, they have other types of organizations, but I'd say 98% of all the, the business is done through the church. Yeah. Because of course people aren't using cash and checks like they used to. Right. 100%. <laughs> yeah. So digital giving, but that growth and you joined them in 2012, seven years ago. No, join them in 2015. Um, oh, they wow. had been, they had been like a year and a half, two years old. And that growth is absolutely crazy. And so, so yeah, so, you know, I, I got recruited. I had no idea who they were. I, I just, I just, I, I had nothing to lose. I was running, you know, marketing and, and digital for uh, a university at the time. And, and then they came knocking and I just was like, yeah, you know, we'll, we'll see what this is all about. And I just, just believed in the CEO, believed his vision, yeah. uh, was very audacious. You've met Chris and, you know, it just, it was you know, a wild ride, but incredible. Yeah. I've spent time with both co-founders, yeah. um, Chris and Elliot. And, uh, so you only worked there for two years. I didn't realize worked that. Worked there two years. One thing, one, one insider joke there is, you know, one day there's like three weeks, three months somewhere else. It, it <laughs> like, it me, the, the speed at which you get things like, you don't grow from 10 to $100 million in two years uh, just by kind of hanging out. You know, you, you, you have rigorous excellence or like you'll get chewed out. Like, I mean, you will literally like get washed out of the business as a result if you're playing 
that mediocre level, um, you know, uh, and so, so you have to come with your A game every single day. I work like a dog and uh, I, I would never trade anything. Like I, I, could, I feel like I can go into any organization and I still do this when I consult, you know, and, and kind of like, it's almost like, you know, uh, chess for me, really understanding what it's going to take, the hires it's going to take, the strategies it's going to take in order to make the right small tweaks that would have massive, massive results on the back end. And I, I, I'm forever grateful for that experience. Yeah. And I think the founders would say it's been a rocket ride that's been exhausting at the same time. <laughs> yeah. Uh, knowing Chris, knowing Elliot and having Absolutely. spent time with them. But what I want to do, because I can already hear, I can already see the fingers typing on the phone or the email going, no organization should ever be that driven. And what about, you know, boom, that kind of growth is not sustainable. So I get that. I get that. And there's a certain point at which that's not sustainable. Yet on the other hand, if you're really going to make an impact, one of my pet peeves, Alejandro, I don't want to pick your brain on that, is churches and organizations that move at a glacial pace. In other words, mm. you know, the opposite side of that is you're the mediocre guy. You're the, you know, I think one sure sign of decline is that your timeline for change and decisions is long. In other words, we were talking about it in March. We're still talking about it today. Uh, that is a sign of decline. And obviously you're saying, you know, a day there is like three weeks or three months somewhere else. Can you tell us about that culture and some of the factors that, that like the positive side of that? Because I think most people instinctively know the negative side of that. But could you tell us why sometimes speed and high growth are good things? Like, what did you well, learn? No, I, I think that's great. You know, one of the things, uh, Chris was an avid, avid reader and he would get us to read books. And, you know, one of the books uh, was was by Bill Walsh and it's called um, The Score Takes Care of Itself. And Bill Walsh is one of the best coaches in football of all time. And he had this idea of the standards of procedures. Uh, is basically you did these things every day. If you make sure to show up every single day and practice um, the game will take care of itself. If you mm. focus and, and lock in every single day and give to uh, your, your talents and give to your team, give to the organization, you, you know, the numbers will, 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 will hit those numbers. And we did every single time as a result. And, you know, most churches, it just, here, here's, here's what's fascinating. And, 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 and I may, may get in trouble for this and you're going to get some <laughs> letters, Carrie, but it's okay. But, but the church, a lot of times push pay, the business world hires for results. Mm. The church world hires for relationships. So my cousin, Andy, he's going, there's no real Andy. He <laughs> is the guy, <laughs> he's the guy that, uh, man, he's amazing. He's got charisma. We should have him be our children's pastor, our, our graphics guy and our worship leader. And we just hire people based on relationships. And the business world is all about what can this person do in this organization to help the culture, uh, move forward and the organization move forward quickly. I actually think the church world can learn, learn from the business world to hire world-class potential and, and develop those people because the church is a great place for leadership and podcasts like this. I think the church world has really influenced a lot of the secular world as far as as, as leadership goes with John Maxwell and your books. And, 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 and I, then I think the business world can learn from the church space as a result of kind of being a little bit more human and relationally and kind. And so I love speed. Why do I love speed? Because the market doesn't care about your glacier, right? Like that, that <laughs> slow movement, like the market will pass you by. And so people are like, oh, I don't really care about it. Like things are fine, but the world is moving at the fastest in the history of man, the world is moving. Now, are you supposed to burn out and, 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 and people be bummed out and then you have a bad glass door review and things of that nature? Absolutely not. There's balance there, but I would always take speed over an excellence, over slow growth and mediocrity. Because what happens is, and I talked to a lot of churches about this, like people want to see energy at the church. And to me, a church is, is, is hitting a lid, 800, 1,000, and just staying there or 200. There's not a lot of energy and excitement and things happening in that church. And to me, that's when I think you see people kind of burn out, start dropping off here and there. And if you're not growing, you're dying, they say. And so that's just the harsh reality, Carrie. One of the realities I had, uh, I was talking to a friend of mine 
because uh, my next book's on burnout and overwhelm. And I was interviewing him. And of course, the stereotype is always that the meat grinder of speed and results, that produces burnout, which it does. It honestly, it does. Absolutely. You know, I'll be talking about that. But what I forgot and what he reminded me of is that death and decline produces burnout as well. That if you're part of a stuck culture and you're part of a declining organization, that can be a very debilitating, demotivating impact as well. And so I think it cuts both ways. Um, I'd love to know what that, because you're driven. Obviously, at age turn 19, you're like, okay, I'm going to go online and figure out what I can learn and get some mentors and like earn some money and drive, right? You're, you're, you're already a self-starter. But what did that pressure cooker at PushPay do for you? What did that call out of you that you didn't know was in you? Yeah, just just the idea of excellence. Like we hear that word, you know, per, you know, uh, I would say, um, you know, perfection, you know, we're, we're not looking for perfection, we're looking for progress. But excellence, like, you know, how can I play at the highest potential that I have? And then how can I keep getting one mile per hour, 1% better every single day. And so so the 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 level of excellence, like the the idea of world class, like imagine waking up every single day and going, I have to be world class. Like how can I position myself? How can I grow? What can I read? What can I listen to that can help me become more world class? And if you have that mindset going into your every day, you will get 1% better every day. On the flip side, you got to find that balance really quickly because, man, I'd come home, my kids, hey, dad, and then my wife would know. I'd go sit down on my bed for like 10, 15 minutes to decompress because, man, it took so much. I like beat down. Uh, but like I said, I wouldn't trade it for the world because now I know the next time, this is a lot like how faith is, like we we kind of go to that next level and now we know, oh, I can, I can handle this. And so now I understand what my limitations are. I still want to play at that world-class level, um, but I also not at the expense of, you know, being tired and, and not having energy for my family and spending time with them because, man, you were on 24-7 there, man. Yeah. So what were some of the habits and disciplines that you picked up that you're keeping? Yeah. So I'm, I'm naturally not an organized person. This is why, you know, I hired a partnered up with someone that's way more organized, uh, you know, uh, yeah, more of a super savvy. Person. <laughs> yeah. She has literally changed the game for me. And, and, yeah. and she was managing like 30 plus at push me. That's where we met, you know, uh, contractors, employees, and kind of running traffic control and going crazy. And so, um, you know, one of the best decisions I've ever made was, was really hiring and, and partnering up with her. Um, but, but I would say, uh, the daily, the daily, uh, planning, you know, they say, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail and being so rigorous about your calendar. Like you have a calendar that you give people the fixed calendar. And for me, uh, we did something similar and we adopted a lot of what great startups and organizations in Silicon Valley did. So every single night, every single Sunday night, I'd plan my entire week. The night before, uh, I would look at the next day and I'd schedule the next day. So when I got in, I knew what my day was and I'd attack it with enthusiasm unknown to mankind. Like that was the attitude I had to have. By the time four o'clock, five o'clock, six o'clock, you know, rolled around, I'm planning, I'm I'm finding out, did I do the top three priorities that I said I was going to do? And if I didn't, let me start scheduling tomorrow. And just that simple thing. And if you look at salespeople at PushPay, one of my best friends is their top salesperson. He is not the most gifted person and he, he knows I love him, but hmm. he, he follows up and he's so meticulous with the details and rigorous with his calendar. And if it's not calendared, it's probably not going to get done. Just like you're probably not dating your wife because it's not in your calendar, pastor. Um, and mm-hmm. so, sorry. And so, so we got to, we got to make sure to plan ahead versus going with the flow and speed, you know, is accompanied by planning the glacier movement is accompanied by going with the flow. And so that was probably one of the biggest things is knowing every single day, but I know what I'm doing 90 days from now and what I'm working towards. I know what I'm doing six months from now, but every single day really attacking it like I'm going to crush this day because if you don't crush your day, your day will, will absolutely destroy you. How, uh, that, that takes an incredible amount of focus. How did you deal with all the incoming while planning out your day. Because that's what happens. You have nothing on the calendar one day. You think, God, I'm going to crush all this work. 
five o'clock rolls around, you haven't got anything done. How, how were you able to fend off outside distractions, incoming requests, all of that it, in the midst of it was It was always calendar. Like it was literally, right. if I had something, hey, hey, sorry, Carrie, uh, I've actually got something on my calendar. Like I literally had a calendar and there were, and, and, and you don't work at a place like that and get last minute. Like we would build an entire marketing. We've done it, we did it several times. An entire market, oh my gosh, this is the best thing since sliced bread. We are complete. You know, we're, we're getting word. We're completely changing everything. And actually, we need to change everything, get it ready by tomorrow. And like now we're, we got to work all weekend to get this done. And so, you know, you got to create margin for those times where those happen and you adjust as you go. And so, so a lot of times the reason that people are pulled in so many directions and so easy is because they're not willing to say no. The moment you say no to, uh, you know, yes to something else, you're literally saying no to a lot of different things. And so one of the things that I love Steve Jobs, he said, I, I'm, I'm more proud of the things I said no to than the things I said yes to. And so I want to say yes to the right things and, and no to things that just they just don't impact the bottom line. This is a mistake I see a lot of leaders, especially in the church, they're focusing so much on the, the details at the bottom and, and not leaving enough time to think high level macro vision. Um, and so they're so bogged down and you know that's really what causes slow growth. And I, I'm really, you know, we're talking about growth. I'm really fascinated. Like it, it's Pushpay was no, literally- I'm fascinated by it too. Pushpay was literally a hyper growth. Jason Lemkin says, you know, zero to 10 million in five quarters, I believe it is, or six quarters is hyper growth. And I think they did it in four quarters. Uh, so so hyper growth unicorn, like that was literally Pushpay. And so, you know, if I work at 80% of that focus, like I think- we're really going to crush it. And I, that's why I think for the agency, I think we're able to help people not only just scale with Facebook ads and Instagram ads and these type of things, but really understand how to make the right pivots and changes and tweaks in order to keep up with the speed of the market. Because the market literally doesn't care about your feelings, about you know what your plan, like you've got to plan around what the market wants, in my opinion. Wow. So then for the last couple of years, you've been running your own agency. Uh, tell us about that. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. Here's the thing. We moved, my wife got her dream job working in the NICU. So we moved three hours east of Seattle and my wife got her dream job and I was going to be a YouTuber, <laughs> literally. Mm -hmm. uh, we had our family, we have a YouTube channel of 35,000. We worked with Disney, Chase, Kohl's, uh, you know, some some really big brands that we've worked with. And I was like, you know, we're just going to roll with this YouTube channel. We were making six figures in YouTube and it was amazing with a very small channel doing brand deals and advertising and those types of things. And, um, you know, I got a call from you. I got a call from Brady Sharir, a good friend, a mutual friend of ours. You connected me with John Acuff and all in a matter of a week. I just said, you know what? Uh, I think the skills that I learned over the last couple of years at, you know, push pay, I think those can ser help me serve the church even better. And so helping people like you, like Brady and some of the organizations that we work with to really bring this level of world-class thinking to the church world. And so I'm deeply, like, I, I like to say, you know, I'm hundred percent business, hundred percent ministry. I love the low, like I love the local church. And I want to be, bring a different level of thinking because not a lot of people in the church space have had this rigorous experience that I had. And so I'm trying to help local churches and people like you advance everything that you're doing because, you know, it's, it's, it's just a new skill that I think the church can learn from. Yeah. Your company's called Digital Napkin. Is that the final yeah, di iteration? Yeah, yeah. Di digital napkin. And we didn't have a name. Like that first week, we're like, we didn't want to start it. And so you and a couple, you know, I was just like, okay, let's I start this I was like agency. client one almost, right? You were client one. And and hey. I'm like, oh my gosh. Like, I'm like, oh my goodness. Like, I'm working with the, the amazing Carrie Newhoff. And just so amazing. It's been amazing to work with you. And, and you've really helped me, uh, you know, uh, you've helped me a ton in a lot of different ways. And just really, you know, for the, for, for, for the folks that are listening, like Carrie's the exact same person he is on the podcast and where you meet him smiling and shaking. That's literally that guy. We've spent some time in person yeah. together. And anytime someone's come up to you, you're not, you're talking to them, you spend time with them. You're not looking around for the next person. And that's like, that's really special. And so you've really helped me understand, you know, someone that is growing a platform, how to really care 
deeply for your community, not look for the next great thing. And so, uh, so yeah, it's been fun working. We work with organizations basically to help them get to the six or seven figure. We really focus on helping, um, you know, kind of content creators, influencers. That's a kind of big word, you know, carry new word influencers mm-hmm. like that. There's influencers, uh, taking cool photos on Instagram. That's not an influencer, but yeah, exactly. uh, 500 but, followers. Look at this. Hey, five. Yeah. I look cute though. It spent 45 <laughs> minutes, but I look cute. Uh, look so cute. Uh, no, but, but, but no, I, 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 we've, we've had a blast. We've worked with, with some amazing organizations and, uh, it's been, it's, it's been such an honor to serve in this way. What, what do you find? Cause there's a lot of entrepreneurial leaders who listen, whether that's in the church world or the business world, but, um, what have been some of the best decisions you've made as a founder CEO in your previous iterations or the current one? My friend CJ um, said this to me in maybe 2002, 2001, and I've stuck with me. He says, prayer is the best strategy. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I literally like did not understand that for the longest time, kind of did things on my own. And I felt like uh, that unmerited grace, that unmerited favor, uh, you know, kind of ran. I, you know, I would say, uh, you know, I don't want to get theological, but it, you know, like I kind of lived off that for a very long time. And then, you know, uh, when we moved years ago, I felt like, you know, that idea of prayer uh, becoming the best strategy that really shifted my, 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 my business acumen. It really shifted my thinking, really partnering with God, you know, God, and really going to him with everything. So to me, prayer is literally the number one strategy for me. That's wonderful. To, you know, there's that old quote from Martin Luther who said, I've got so much to do today. I can't imagine not praying for three hours before I start, <laughs> which is extremely convicting to me personally. Yes. No, I can't it, remember it, the last time I prayed for three hours, but it, it really is, man. You're like, you're releasing God's energy on your life, you know, like, like, and, and I say that I have this tattoo right here. It says God's son. And like, I just think about that. I, I think about, um, you know, that same DNA, that same power, that same grace, that, that enablement, that, that, you know, we, we think of this, this amazing, we think of grace, like amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch from, you know, like we think about it, the saving grace, but there's like this grace, this unmerited favor that Paul talks about in second Corinthians 10, 13. And uh, it's, it's a really fascinating scripture. He says, uh, but we will not boast beyond limits, but we will boast only with regard to the area of influence God has assigned us. And what he's talking about is this lane, like the Olympics, this, this lane that you have in your life. And so I guess one of the best things that I would tell you is knowing your area of influence, your sphere. Brian Houston talks about the grace zone. Like what is the lane in life that you're supposed to, to do? What is the God assignment on your life? And one of the most important things that I think I've done is I've gotten so close to that perfect lane for my life. I've always refined it. And I see one of the, one of the biggest tells, Carrie, of people that are not in their grace zone, that are not in their area of influence, their sphere, uh, that lane is their frustration. They're always complaining about their leader. They're always complaining mm. about other staff members. One of the biggest tells of people not doing the right job is they're just, they're just complaining all the time. They're not in the right lane. They're not in the right seat. And so, um, yeah, so so I, I really think one of the most important things is really discovering, you know, what it is that you're called to do with the thing you're passionate about, the thing that you're purposed to do. That 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 one of the things I, I would say that's probably my mission in life is to help as many people figure that thing out. Because you figure that thing out, you can do extraordinary things in my mind. Hmm. What are some of the challenges of leading your own organization? Yeah, you know, uh, hiring friends and firing friends, you know, like, you know, like the reality of it is, you know, there's people that, you know, that, you know, you think you think they're going to do a good job. And that's just, you know, you know, they always say, you know, I've heard this before, like, would you hire them again? Like, would you if you had to do it all over again? And, and, and a lot of times, you know, it's 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 maybe not. And, and making those decisions to 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 fire people. And I guess I guess personnel those resources, the people that you hire and fire is probably one of the most difficult things as a CEO in an organization, like telling people like, Hey man, like we got to part, you know, we got to, we got to go our separate ways. And then seeing people cry, it's just like, you know, like we're just being honest here. Like it's very, very heartbreaking. 
but I will tell you this, partnering with God, praying is the best strategy. Prayer is the best strategy. I've seen those people go on to flourish. I've, I've prayed for those people and, and I've seen them to go off and do great things as a result of, you know, ending things well. I, th- I think that's really important is, you know, firing stinks, uh, hiring. It's just so difficult, man. You're always nervous if, if this is the right person in the right spot. Um, but if, if you end it well, you know, I think that that's, that's, that's the biggest thing. How do you talk yourself through that? Because we've all been there, and I would say that's probably of all the leaders I've talked to, uh, it always ranks near the top. It's probably number one most often. It's like, it's just the people aspect. Yeah. You know, the conflict, the uh, terminations, the resignations. Like, And I know when I look back on the lens of my leadership, hands down, number one hardest thing I go through is just people stress. And I've been blessed with a really great team in the different organizations I've served. But it's still hard when when it doesn't work out. So how do you walk slash talk yourself through those tough moments? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a difficult thing. I think it's really seeking counsel. It's, it's, uh, you know, trying to navigate and and here, here's what I will say. I see a lot of leaders in the church because they haven't hired and fired and, and understand the corporate side, the business side of things. Um, they would go, yeah, this Johnny's not doing well. I haven't talked to Johnny. I haven't coached Johnny about this situation. But my wife knows all about it. Action. My <laughs> wife knows all about it. I, 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 I put it in sub tweets in, in sub, you know, I put, you know, I'm passive aggressive on Facebook about it. Um, but I haven't even talked to Johnny to level them up. So I would always say that someone should never know that they're getting fired. Like they should uh. never, ever know. Like they should have a level of, it should never come as a surprise. Yeah, they should never be surprised. They they, they would never, they would never be, they should never be surprised that it's coming. You know, when you, when you share that news, Hey, we've, we've gone through this. We've, we've went through a 90 day plan. We've given you a coaching uh, uh, plan. You've signed it. We've, we've had one-on-ones we've met together. And unfortunately at the capacity, like world-class level that I know that you're, you can do, is, is unfortunately the reason we're going to have to part ways here. And so, so you got to really address it. And I, I, that doesn't yeah. mean go fire everybody. If you have not exhausted every opportunity to level people up, that's just poor form. That is absolutely poor form. And so, so I think we've got to, as, as, because churches are usually understaffed, you know, mm-hmm. by, by half a lot of times. And so it's like, oh man, I don't have time for one-on-ones. I don't have time to engage and build people up. And, you know, I would say that is one of the, the worst things that leaders can do is to not spend time with their people and help them grow and level up uh, their leadership. No, it's so interesting. I don't know what the quote is. I'm going to mangle it a little bit, but uh, Tim Ferriss often quotes it. It's like, uh, your capacity is directly determined to your ability to have difficult conversations. And I think that's true. There was someone I was talking with this morning, again, one of my top team members, and uh, I just adore this person. And it was about hours. And Mm -hmm. I thought I could feel myself starting to complain privately rather than raise it publicly. We had a really quick, awesome conversation about it. And it was a result to everyone's satisfaction. And I thought, oh my gosh, like, I knew where that was going because I've done this long enough where I would be like, well, I wish that blah, blah, blah. And, you know, I wouldn't say it publicly and hopefully avoid the passive aggressive email or tweet or social media status update. But like all I had to do was say, actually, can we talk about this? And we did. And actually, we resolved it in about five minutes. Like it wasn't just wasn't hard at all. And uh, I, I but the fact that I have to keep reminding myself of that after all these years astounds me. I think I call it savvy knows this now, like this is going to sting a little bit. Like it's a sting. Mm. It's, it's, uh, you know, Google actually calls it a nudge. There's a, there's an ah. actual thing in Google. They call it a nudge and a nudge is simply, and that's what we call it out. Like, Hey, this is a simple nudge. Love you. But man, we really, we really, we, and they know it's them. We really missed the mark here. You know, Jocko, you know, the gentleman, uh, the, the Navy SEAL, Jocko Willink. Jocko Willink. Or, yeah. yeah, he he says, there are no bad teams, they are only bad leaders, right? So, mm. so you need to take the responsibility on you to figure out what you can do better as a leader, but remind them, you, you know, it's that radical candor idea of, of really speaking up and, hey, this is going to sting a little bit, but, but it always comes out so much better. Like on the, and, and, and the relationship as a result of that vulnerability, we've talked at length at, at your offset about vulnerability. When you start to 
be vulnerable with your team and you have that radical candor, I think bond it just it goes through the roof. And when you create that level of bond, your team will do so much more than they're currently doing for you. I really believe that. Well, and you and I have had to have conversations from time to yep. time where you've said yes. to me, hey, excuse me, or I've said, hey, um, we need to yep. talk. And it just makes you stronger. Like it does. just makes the bond deeper. Okay. Well, this is really, I love the backstory. I could, I could live in the backstory, but I do want to talk about online marketing a little bit. So man, things are changing, as you said, not at a glacial pace, but at exponential pace. Um, you want to give us a, just a, like when people say online marketing or digital marketing, like what does that term mean to you? To me, it means you have an idea, you have a message, you have a product, you have a service, you have something that you would love to put in front of people because you believe that it will solve their problem or their pain point. The market has a pain point, a problem, and you believe your product is, you should position it this way, as the only viable option to these people. And so online marketing to me, digital marketing is really using um, the web, um, paid advertising, free forms of advertising to get this in front of them uh, so that they can make a decision for themselves to, to buy or maybe not right now, but eventually. So I'm sold on that. You're sold on that. But we've all read our inboxes and we see what gets written. There are business leaders and church leaders who are like, I, I'm, you know, convince me that this is even important. And how is that not just all about ego? Like, why does online marketing matter? Can you respond to that for a minute, Alejandro? Because I think it's, 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 it's a real, like this, that critique never seems to go away or that indifference to it never seems to go away or maybe even ambivalence about it never seems to go away. Can I give a very polarizing, bold response? Is that okay? Absolutely. I think it is grossly irresponsible to not share your ideas. Like keep in mind, you know, Proverbs 18, 16 says a man's gift makes room for him and brings him before the great, right? So we have these giftings inside of us where, where Peter, and Peter talks about use your gift I think it's grossly irresponsible not to share your gift. Your gift that has got you to where you're at leader, it's not yours. So Paul says to share it and steward it with one another. And so you have to share your gift, your product, your service. And especially for pastors, you know, they spend 10 plus hours crafting a sermon, praying for some, crying out to God uh, for, for their, their parishioners, uh, and what ends up happening is, you know, come Monday morning, that that is that was locked in those four walls. And so I say, how do we, you know, we got to use digital marketing to share our sermons, to share our ideas, uh, because, um, you know, it, it's a good thing. It's a godly thing to share our giftings and our ideas with other people. And it's really not about you, because that's the biggest thing that I talk, especially in the church space. It's Man, I I I don't want to I don't want to build a platform. It's not about me. It's about it's about God. It's about you know pointing people back to Him. But I would say is that as you grow your platform, you grow your influence. As long as you stay humble, you will have a louder you know uh, mic, if you will, to to share what all the goodness that God has done in your life. And so to me, it's grossly irresponsible to not put your stuff out there. Uh, you mentioned humility. How, how do you stay humble while marketing yourself, your message, your product, your service, your, your business, your church, whatever, like how, cause that is one of the inherent tensions is people say, well, doesn't this just make me a narcissist? Like how can you market while staying humble? Another polarizing, in my opinion, like if you have the audacity to be a pastor, there's a level of, e you know, if you have an audacity to want to climb the corporate ladder, there's a level of significance, not narcissism, ego. There's a, le a level of the human behavior that, or, or uh, the human need that would say, I want, I want my, I want to do meaningful work. Like, who are we to even say that? Right. But I think that's actually okay. You know, how do I stay, stay humble? Sarah Nicole, that's my wife. Like she would crush me if I ever got my head you know, big enough. I, there was a, there's a mentor years ago because I was before Sarah's a pretty egotistical guy. You know, I, I had this ego and, and he would say, man, if your bank account was bigger than your head, you would be a millionaire. 
<laughs> and, and so, and so, you know, I would say giving the permission, that vulnerability to a community, to your wife, to go, hey man, Carrie, I, you know, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm starting to catch some momentum online. I'm starting to catch some momentum in my church. I need you across the way to, to always check in with me. And if you feel that that post, that tweet, the, the way I'm coming across, like, give me a gentle nudge, like, give me a nudge. Some, some of the nudges they sting, but, but having the community around you, you know, banning Leapshear from Jesus culture talks about, uh, sometimes God speaks in through people, through community. And so having those people around you to really speak in, in, into your life, uh, it really has hep, kept me humble for sure. So find people around the leaders that make me the most nervous are the ones that don't have anyone in their ear. So yeah. That is, that's, that, that makes me nervous. And so you got to have people in your life to, to, um, to keep you accountable. Let's pop the hood open a little bit because you and I've had that conversation and, and mostly just so you guys know, leaders know, or anybody who sort of follows the other things I do, Alejandro has helped the most probably with our courses, right? High Impact Leader, Art of Better Preaching, Church Growth Masterclass are sort of the three key courses that I'm currently offering with, with more to come. So when we do a launch, Alejandro and his team are the people sort of behind that, the Facebook ads, et cetera, et cetera. And you and I have had numerous conversations about voice and some of the principles that are going to guide that. And I'm not saying I always get it right. I don't always get it right. We all have our narcissistic moments. But what have been some of the principles that have been defining? You want to just pop the hood open and talk about that transparently as we've discussed what is the tone we want to strike, the voice of our company and our brand and, and what that looks like. Cause that's been very clarifying for me because I do feel the ambivalence around, um, you know, marketing yourself or even my reluctance to go to those photo shoots that apparently are so important. Right. So <laughs> can we, can we talk about that for a little bit? All those Cause candid, I think that would be a good all those case candid study. photos. All those no, candid I think it, photos. You know? Yeah. I think uh, and those are amazing. Uh, those are amazing photos, but, but I would say, when you look at your leaders, when you look at your clients, when you look at your customers, for those that are, are listening right now, um, look at them like one, one word that captures everything about them. And the thing when we first started talking, Carrie, the thing that you made absolutely clear multiple times and then multiple times again was that trust mattered most to you and you wanted to serve, not sell people. And so when I think of carry to my team, so now I know as the leader, I've got to communicate that and articulate that to my team. So I go to my team and say, hey, tone, uh, trust is really, really important. So when we're, when we're selling to people, we want to make them feel like we're serving them. And, and we want to make sure that we're staying on brand for carry. And trust is the most important thing. So for another client, it might be, you know, loyalty or it might be excellence or so for me, the thing that's really helped me the most is understanding your biggest, your most the thing that matters most to you needs to matter most to me and my entire team. So anytime we're writing copy, anytime we're thinking about scripting a video, anytime we're creating an ad, we're always looking at it through that one idea, that one word, which is trust. Yeah. It's so interesting because we have talked about that. And I think it might've been you who said serving before selling. And that has been so valuable to me that I really, I want to serve leaders. Uh, and in the process, if you happen to buy a course, that's awesome. You know, if you happen to do this, that's awesome. And obviously I, we poured a lot of time and energy and resources into the courses. So we, I actually want as many people as possible to take them because I think they'll help them. But that whole idea of trust that you can you can literally just ruin trust. It takes years to build. You can wreck it in a second. Um, those have been really good guiding principles. Anything else that comes to mind when you're trying to establish a brand character online? Yeah, I think it. I think um, you know. I, I we can get really deep into this, but you know, we've done like the core values, the principles, those type of things, like. You know, there's, there's attributes. There's so much when it comes to, when it comes to a brand, but the, the thing that matters most, I would say is, uh, for any brand, any church, any organization, any personal brand is like showing care 
for people. I alluded to it earlier about the how much you are locked into a conversation, but like you genuinely care about your people. You put out emails. Most people send promotional emails a lot and their email open rates are five, 10%. No one's buying, they're wondering why. But you've actually increased your email. You've ran that through a lens of care and value and I wanna serve people well and your open rates are up, your email list is bigger than ever, and people, your unsubscribes are lower than ever. Why? Because you're serving people instead of trying to, to sell them. So to me, I would say showing that care and getting back to servant, uh, you know, that servant leadership idea, I think it's really, really critical for a brand. Yeah, so for us, just uh, for leaders, uh, you know, the, the lens for email for me is, is this helpful? Like, it's free, Okay, we have, I think now over 52,000 people who subscribe to the daily email, almost daily. I think I take one day off a week. Wow. But, um, you know, and, and it's short, sometimes less than 100 words, but it links to a resource that we think is important. And the idea is you paid with your time. Yeah, it was free. But like, are you a better person for having opened this email? Not just a happy thought, but like tangible help, tangible hope, or something that makes you a better leader? And if we can answer yes, then that's an email worth sending. Do we get it right every day? I'm sure we don't get it right every day, but that's sort of the goal. And so it's in the context, and I don't say those have to be your values, but as you and me and our teams have developed those values together, I have gained more confidence that I'm actually helping people uh, mm. as the platform grows. That's amazing. And, uh, you know, that's what we want. You want to go out there and like, you weren't this conf like when you started several years ago, you were like, you, you know what I mean? Like you had to build the team, you had to build the yeah. structure and infrastructure. I think most people will look at you and go like, Oh my God, that to try to start a podcast, to try to start building a personal brand, to try to get this book idea or my third book that I'm working on out there, they're looking at Carrie and go, Oh my gosh, 10 million, 12 million downloads. I, I just could never do that. And you were, were you always that confident when you started? <laughs> Oh, no. I mean, and see, this is another conversation, right? Like, should you start out to build a personal brand? My goal was not to build a company or to build a brand. Um, my goal was to help people. It's like, okay, I'm going to write some articles and I want to bring some backroom conversations that I'm really enjoying to a wider audience. Uh, you know, I had crazy audacious goals about like 100,000 page oh views gosh. in a year. Wow. And, you know, now it's probably this year will be seven, eight million. I don't know. Amazing. And then, and then the podcast, I thought maybe one day a million downloads, like years down the road. Well, closing in on 10. It's like, yes. what? Like, okay. I, but, but I think, tell me if you're wrong. Okay. Cause you work with a lot of different clients. I would often find the people who are interested in the content and the idea tend to eventually get the numbers the people who are interested or could potentially get the numbers, the people who are interested in just, you know, make me get 10,000 followers overnight, Alejandro, they, they never seem to do as well. That your motivation, people eventually sniff out your motivation. I think that's the difference between an impression and an impact. An impression mm. is like, you know, a one hit wonder. You know, Jay-Z, I saw an interview with, with, uh, with Oprah, I know a lot of your audience listens to Jay-Z, so that's why it's a, people make sense. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but, but he said, you know, hey, try, you know, people can come and go and they can get some energy, they can get some followers and all that stuff, but try doing it for a decade. Try doing it for two decades. Um, you know, uh, Tom's Shoes, one thing that was fascinating, they sold, they make about $17 per shoe and someone asked them, you know, you're not, that's not very profitable. So we never got into this for the profitability. We got into this for the sustainability. And so it makes me think mm. of those guys that people I've been, I'm pitched, Hey, you want to get on Eek magazine and get 10,000 followers? Now, that is, that's a quick impression. That's a one hit wonder, but for, and profitable, like for a day or two or a year. But for people that want long-term growth, long-term impact, um, uh, those are the people that that slow and steady. There's ways to speed that up with like paid traffic and those type of things. But that's where impact and impression and to me are completely different things. And uh, I want an impact. I know you do too. And mm -hmm. that's what matters most to me. Okay, this is really good because it sounds like it's not a conversation on online marketing, but in my mind, it's 100% a conversation <laughs> on online marketing. Because I've, I've talked about this. I've been, you know, blogging fairly steadily now for seven years. Actually, this month, seven years. And 
I've been talking with a few colleagues and some of us look around and it's like, wow, okay, five years into this podcast, seven years into regular blogging later, remember all the people we started with? Mm. And, and there's a few of us still standing. And yep. it was just writing when you didn't feel like writing, publishing, trying to serve, getting through, you know, the personal angst. And it's not easy, but I think there is that desire whether or not you're getting the results you want. Like, you know, if you're getting zero after three years, well, you should probably reassess your strategy or whether you're actually reaching yes. anybody. But um, I think some of that is that longevity and that desire that, no, this is like, I've now feel into this. This is every bit as much as uh, of a calling in my life as it was 20 years ago to plant a church on church people love to attend. Still like you passionate about the local church, involved in the local church, but you know, now my goal is to help leaders, to help people thrive in life and leadership. And I, I see that as a calling. And so guess what? Kind of when I feel like just putting my feet up, no, this is a calling. You better get to work. And, and that is sort of the heart of it. And I think you can sniff that out online. A hundred percent. You know, I really believe consistency builds trust and trust builds loyalty. And loyalty yes. is what allows you to do this for a long time, you know, you've been writing a, you know, putting out a blog every single week and now two times, you know, and then a podcast on a consistent basis. A lot of people, you know, they'll, they'll quit after seven blog. I think it's like seven. I think they say people stop at like seven podcasts. It's like, man, success was right around the corner, but you didn't get that instant gratification and you quit. Um, so, so this is why I love talking about marketing, but through the frame of more of psychology, because you know, you've got to understand that the algorithms, they, it, it rewards you for posting more consistently, but people that you see, a lot of those people probably quit because they was, weren't seeing immediate results. Their consistency was, was, they had no consistency. And so they just dropped off because a lot of times they were probably just in it for impression, uh, and fake influence. I call it artificial influence, hmm. uh, versus true influence and impact for people. How is online marketing at the end of 2019 now heading into 2020? How is that different than say even three years ago? Because you and I have frequent conversations about how Facebook is changing and we've been through a few massive algorithm shakeups and um, that changes the game all the time. So how would you say you've seen online marketing change in the last few years? I, w I have two answers for this. The first one is really simple. It's uh, to me, I like to think that uh, it, I love, there's more people here. And so mm. people freak out with competition. Oh my gosh. Like I actually love that because to me, I have this idea in my mind that best strategy always wins. If you have the best strategy, you will always win because it's just like, you know, it's very cyclical. People will come like, oh, I want to be real estate agent. Oh, that's done. I want to be a loan officer. Now I want to be a social media influencer. Now I want to be a YouTuber. And so people, you know, ride those waves. And so more people are coming to the web. More people are becoming influencers. More people are buying followers. And so that kind of washes out. So the what's changed is literally there were less people doing this influencer thing, this personal brand thing, you know, three to five years ago. And people say, well, it's more expensive to, you know, spend money on Facebook. It's, 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 it's harder. Organic reach used to be 20, 30, 40% four or five years ago. And now, you know, it's like, it's sparse. Like it's 1% maybe. And so the reason I like that is because, you know, the, the, um, the, the funkies, they, they leave, they, they're yeah. gone. Like they, 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 they leave, the quick right? Fix people are all like, they, all right, I give they're, up. Yeah. They're gone. They give up so easy, but people that have a great strategy will always, and this is why you say we're, we're, we're talking about marketing, but we're not talking about marketing. Yeah. The, at the end of the day, the same strategy that I implemented 20 years ago is the same strategy that I'm still, I'm refining it but it's still the same strategy today. And it'll be the same strategy five to 10 years from now. The, the technologies are always changing. And if I'm a leader, don't worry so much about that. Hire people that are smarter than you, like Carrie, to kind of figure those things out. But always stay true. You post a consistent podcast, a consistent blog, and that's kind of your constant. And, you know, and so to me, I would say it hasn't changed. It's just changed because there's more people doing it. Oh, that's interesting. So consistency would be a pillar of online marketing and that would be 100%. a consistent voice. Cons and again, you don't have to publish every week. You, we do this podcast about six times a month. Uh, I will 
post content to my blog two or three times a week, a couple of podcasts a week sometimes. So that's plenty of content. Um, but it could be once a month. I just post 12 times a year or it could be daily or it could be multiple times a day or whatever that that would happen to be, but just consistent. Like if you're every other week, just be every other week. Absolutely. What are, what are some other pillars that probably are not going to change in online marketing? The pillars, I would say it's to me, I'm, it's an audience first mentality. Mm, you know, love it. audience, audience first, people that know how to, that really understand their audience. The moment that you understand their frustrations, their pains, uh, what they want to escape from and arrive to, uh, if you really understand that and can articulate and speak to them back, you know, the words that they're saying at their head, that, that they're spinning around at, at 1 a.m. as they look up at the ceiling. If you can say those exact words versus internal jargon and trying to sound so smart, if you could repeat those words back to them because you have an audience first mentality, that's that's really what matters. And, and, and to me, uh, you know, you talked about content. I would say, you know, you know, you had our mutual friend Sean Cannell on, you know, video is very powerful. Um, you know, video is very powerful. And so I like to think about, you know, uh, five years ago, which, which is different, people would run an ad to Facebook and, and sell right away and sell right away. What you and I've done, you've got some Facebook videos that have, you have a video that almost has 500,000 views on there. I don't know if you knew that. Uh, you have some that have, you have some that have a couple hundred thousand, 80,000, and there's no call to action to buy anything at the end. And so to me, what that says is you're giving value upfront with no strings attached. And then Facebook, and we're going to get geeky real quick and I won't get too geeky, but Facebook will allow you, Facebook will allow you to say, Hey, these 400,000, these 500,000 people that watch this five minute video, I then want to send a promotional, um, uh, message or video to people that watched 50% or 75% or 25% of that video. So what happens is think of it like a funnel or like an assimilation type process. Um, like you hope, hopefully you have at your church, uh, you know, you put in front of sales content in front of people that trust you a little more than just people that are kind of, you know, on the side. So you're kind of warmed that. up. You're sort of, you're sort of known for that. Are warm, those, what video warm. is that? That got half. That's the, and, and, and here's the thing. It's, it's why Ted talks are oh, more yeah. popular than sermons. And, and it was a polarizing, bold statement. And I think a lot of times we got to be more bold, not to be controversial, but you have ideas. Like I, this is why I love you. Like you have some ideas and you're just going to say them. You're not going to do it for controversy's sake and to try to ruffle feathers. You actually believe what you're saying because you want to shake people a little bit to think differently about what they're currently thinking. And when you create that level of content, then, you know, it's like, it's like posting something like, you know, if I was, if I was did something like, you know, like, you know, here's why your church, here's why your church won't grow in 2020. Ooh, that's going right. to get someone's attention. But then I would begin to say your church won't grow in 2020 unless you do this one thing. So, so you always want to hit them with, not always, you all you use a lot of times with marketing, kind of want to hit them with that fear uh, and, then, and then really give them a future hope of what it looks like doing it the right way. And so I always like to, with clients, is put out free content and pay traffic uh, through Instagram ads, Facebook ads to that traffic. And then on the back end, market to people that are more warm and hot, like you said. Right. And yeah, that the point of that video, if people want, we'll link to it if we can. I don't know that you can link to that, but we would yep. in the show yep. notes. Okay. So we'll link to that TED Talk video. My point was actually, what is the proper length for a message? And uh, I think the bottom line of that video is five minutes of boring is five minutes too long and 40 minutes of fascinating isn't nearly enough. And it was just to debunk that idea that you TED Talks are inherently better than sermons, that everybody has to preach 18 minutes. Man, 18 minutes of boring is just boring. I don't care what it is. And if you if you said, if you titled it, what's the ideal length of a sermon? People are like, eh. Yeah, you nobody would like, <laughs> thinking about that, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we were just doing some coaching on the team today about an email subject line. It was the same thing. It, it just asked a question that nobody ever asks in their real life. And how often do we do that in our messaging? Right. It's what Donald Miller says. It's not like we're the best lawn care company since 1945. It's like uh, your grass is greener than anyone on the street. Oh, well, all of a sudden that's like, okay, well, that's something I'm like, I want green grass, you know, or 
I want a weed free lawn or I want, I want perfectly cut grass or nice lines. Lines are great. Anyway, um, you know, but that, that, that is the angle. And so that can help you think about that. Like, yeah, nobody, probably people are not going to watch your 40 minute message or your one hour sales video, but they will watch a three minute clip and that sort of warms you up to them. And that can be a funnel into longer content, right? Absolutely. So let's talk as we kind of wrap up Alejandro about low hanging fruit. So people are thinking about, um, maybe doing more in terms of online marketing, uh, what are some quick wins, some ways without, you know, I believe they have to play the long game, but what are some ways that people can say, hey, if I pay attention to these few things, I will probably have a bigger impact online. Yeah, you know, we talked real briefly about personal branding. Like you you have a personal brand. You're either going to uh, define it or people are going to define it for you. And so the one really quick win is like your Facebook pages bio, your Instagram bio. Uh, It's just a really simple tweak to your bio. And it's, it's a framework that it's a sentence. It's I help your target audience um, with X, Y, Z, you know, or I help, um, you know, I help Christian entrepreneurs turn passion to profit, you know? So, Hmm. so really quick, like you, you know, you, because what happens is when people, especially millennials, they're not only looking at websites, they're looking at your Instagram bio, they're looking at your, your, what you're telling, you know, how you're defining your, you know, your bio on your, your website. And so for pastors and leaders, before they even buy with you, people, I always say people buy people. And so, so they're going to do some digging on who you are. And so if you can, in your bio, uh, really, you know, really simply, cause you get 160 characters, I think it is. It's like, I help, you know, uh, d- with desired outcome. I help, you know, target audience with desired outcome. So I help, um, you know, I help pastors, um, you know, live like never before or have, you know, raise their leadership or whatever it is. Um, and if you're a pastor of a local church, I help people of the Tri-Cities, um, you know, ha- have their best life ever or whatever it is. You just mm-hmm. have to start. That's just a quick win. One, one yeah, easy Start a relationship quick win. with Christ or whatever it happens to be or... I, I was just checking my bio. It's like, I help people thrive in life and leadership, but it's not my first sentence. So I'll have to change that. And, and that's the first thing that it's like, it's almost like a headline, right? So it's like real quickly, what is this person, who they are, what they, what do they do and how can they help me? That's what they're thinking. When I'm looking at your profile, you know, people selfishly, subconsciously are thinking, how, what's in it for me? And so if you mm. tell them what's in it for them in that really quick, you know, little framework or positioning statement, um, it really helps big. Oh, that's good. Um, anything else that you would say, hey, try this one or two things, like anything from profile pic to what you're offering? I mean, just help people cut through their own clutter to get their message out. I think the last thing would, would, would be to have a big idea, like have a, have a framework. Um, it's almost like your life thesis. It's like live in a way today that will help you thrive tomorrow. This is the Yeti yeah. cup that that you sent me. So that's a big idea. And you would unpack that later. But what is your unique framework, your step by step system that you help people do? So, you know, so so not only did I get their attention, but what makes me unique? You know, how do I help people? And so some sort of unique framework, some sort of unique system uh, that you do that no one else has done, or you kind of call something, you know, Pat Flynn, uh, who, 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 who's, you know, you know, um, he, he, there, you know, in, in the late 2000s, um, 2010, you know, people were calling about content distribution, take one piece of content, blog post, turn it into a video, turn it into an audio, put it on this website and spread your content everywhere. That was a long way to say what Pat said. He said, here's my be everywhere strategy. So he named a strategy that other people were talking about. And so if you can name some sort of framework that other people that you've refined and came up with, uh, people buy frameworks, they buy systems, they buy processes. And so if you can kind of come up with your own unique process as a church leader, as a business person, entrepreneur, uh, it really defines who you are because it tells people exactly what you're going to get versus, you know, spending hours trying to explain what you do. No, oh, no, that's good. How do you keep up with all the changes? What, I just, are, what are I, some pro tips? No, that's good. I, I, I follow, 
I follow industry leaders. I'm a part of some Slack groups of, you know, you know, I'm part of one of the biggest, uh, you know, especially for me, media buying, Facebook advertising, paid traffic. So I'm, I just spend the money. You know, I go to conferences. I spend the money on courses. I spend the money more. I spend the money more on access to people than I do on courses uh, because I can ask questions. You know, there's, there's, no, there's nothing more powerful than getting access to to people. So, so people that have relationships at Facebook, so people that have, you know, relationships with the top media buyers. And so for me, I will always pay for access to what does that look right like? People. Like a coach, a mentor, or a one day event, or what, do, what does that look like? Yeah. So I, you know, pay a hundred dollars a month to a media buying, um, you know, it's a hundred bucks, 1200 bucks a year, but some of the best, best money spent. Cause if I have a question, I'll ask, uh, you know, I participate and help other people too. So it really keeps me on my toes, helps me refine. I've hired a coach before, and I know you have as yep. well, someone to really nudge you. And it doesn't even feel like a nudge to really coach and level you up. And we live in a day and age, bro, where people just do not want to be like, ah, I don't want it to feel like, oh, everything's PC. Like, oh, don't, you know, like mm -hmm. we want it so easy. And so what I would say, how do I try to, you know, get better every single day? It's like, I just do the hard things. I, I you know, read a ton um, I listen to a ton of books. I spend time with people and I just make the effort. And, and, and back to like the beginning of the podcast is like, I calendar things in, I calendar all yeah. those things and make time for those things. No, that's good to know. And you know, the whole coaching thing's been kicking my butt lately. And the thought that's really been owning a lot of real estate in me is the better you get, the more coaching you need. And that's not intuitive. hundred percent. But you know, if you're, top of the world tennis player, you've got more than one coach. You've, you know, if you're a elite golfer, football player, you got a whole bench of coaches on a football team and they're hyper specialized. And, you know, you think uh, naturally, I just think, oh, well, there's going to be a point at which I don't need coaching anymore. And it's like, no, the opposite is true. You actually, the higher you go, the more coaching you need. And so 2020 is going to be a year where I probably hire another one-on-one -on -one consultant coach, uh, maybe start a mastermind. Uh, I've done a lot of learning in 2019 and have grown so much from it. And uh, yeah, that is, that's not an expense. That's an investment if you're using it to produce something for the future. So that's if you really, start really a good. mastermind, if you start a mastermind and I know people like, we're like, Oh my gosh, where can I go find it? Like, yeah, you'd have 15, 20 people email. I would sign up for that thing. And I'm going to, I'm going to nudge you to do that mastermind in 2020. You nudge me, you nudge me because <laughs> I, I, it's funny. I had a, a, a conversation with another guy who runs a company about the size of my company because I've thought about joining one rather than launching one. And I'm just like, would you be interested in doing one with just peers? Like we just meet once a month, we do a zoom call and maybe we get in, together in person and just like, okay, what personnel struggles are you having? What's your company doing next? What are your personal struggles? How's your time management? Just that kind of thing and best practices from peers and people who are roughly the same or ahead of you could be could be pretty cool. So I think so, man. I'm just trying to figure all that out. But anyway, well, Alejandro, you're doing an awful lot. You uh, do you want tell us where if people want to find out more about you, you got some cool things going on. Where would you direct them? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I would say my Instagram, it's at Alejandro Reyes. And then if you are a Christian entrepreneur um, or someone that's looking to create a side income, if you work for the church, uh, just go to Facebook. I got a great resource, a great free Facebook group for you to do where I do a lot of training. It's just type in Christian Entrepreneur School in the Facebook search bar and you will find our Facebook group there. And you can join it. Now, do you have to work for a church or could you have your own business and you just happen to be a faith-based person or how does that work? Here's what's crazy. I would say 50% of the people are church workers in there. I was so fascinated and mind blown when I saw that. So it's anybody that wants to get a message out there and really turn what they okay. already know into, into a, a business. Good. Alejandro, anything else you want to share? No, that's it, man. Hey, grateful for you, man, and all that you do, all the sacrifice that you've made, all the books that you write about that sacrifice and burnout <laughs> and all that stuff. Like, I just appreciate all the toll that you've taken to, uh, I, I've got friends of mine that have messaged me that, man, I'm crying reading Carrie's book right now. And the impact that you've had on the church has been tremendous, man. So love you. I'm so grateful that we get to work together. And I think your best days 
are, are ahead of you, man. And, and so is this podcast. Well, thank you again. Well, I'm so grateful for you, Alejandro. We've had some incredible times together, many more to come. Love you, man. And thanks for being on the show. And I'm excited to uh, maybe introduce some leaders who've never had the pleasure of meeting Alejandro Reyes to do exactly that. Thanks, guys. Thank you.